Welcome to AI for You, the go to podcast for higher ed professionals looking to integrate AI into their daily work. I'm your host, Brian Piper, the Director of Content Strategy and Assessment at the University of Rochester. Join me every other Thursday for practical uses of AI within higher education communications, marketing, and student engagement. We'll focus on ways to quickly integrate AI into your teams to increase your efficiency and effectiveness and help you optimize your workflows and processes. I'll interview experts and feature relevant use cases with the goal that every episode gives you at least one thing you can take away and start leveraging in your job today. AI for You is a part of the Enrollify Network, a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher education professionals like you grow. Explore our other shows at Enrollify.org. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform helping institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com. Welcome to AI for You. We're joining you live from the AMA Symposium for the Marketing of Higher Education. And we are here with Maria Kuntz. She is the Director of Creative Communications and Services at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Thank you for joining us, Maria. Thank you, Brian. It's great to be here. So tell me some of the different ways that you're using AI at CU Boulder. Yeah, we are using it in a variety of ways from helping with, you know, administrative tasks and, you know, getting things done faster. An example of that is I recently took, uh, it was an internal communications project, helping somebody get a message out. And there was a really long email thread going back and forth with content. And some of it felt very train of thought. There were about four people in the email thread. And we needed to turn it around. So the first cut I did was to take that whole email thread and put it into chat GPT and say, can you help me formulate how I need to communicate this information? And it was about supporting people to apply for grants on campus. And the first time it came back, it was, it was pretty good, but then it just didn't focus in a certain area that I needed it to focus in. So then I went back and edited the prompt and said, okay, can you redo this and focus on this section of the material and really highlight this? And it transformed that email really quickly so then I was able to, you know, kick that off to some coworkers um, and say, hey, let's, this is a good first draft. Now I need your edits and feedback. And they had like three comments and we were off and running. It's amazing how quickly it can take even just like a first rough cut at something and get you 80% of the way there and aggregating all of those disparate, different voices and comments. And, you know, as you said, the, the train of thought and just organizing that and putting it together for you cleanly. Yeah, it would have taken me probably an hour to two hours just to really sort out the hierarchy of information, what was important, fact check things. And, you know, it, it just made it so much easier. And I felt like I could help my colleagues because I could move faster with that tool. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't really need to be, it's not the best use of your time to be going through and organizing their thoughts and their input. So, yeah. And the bot did it really well. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. What, what else is uh, working well for you? What other use cases are you finding? Yeah, I'll go for a simpler one right now. Uh, we, part of my team's portfolio is the University Magazine. And I, we've already been using it with, you know, titling is really tricky. And titling for articles, we have, you know, 35 to 40 stories, probably 15 of those truly need titles and subheads. And that could be really fun and creative work that can also be a brain drain. And we had done it a little here and there, taken a story, put it in, said, you know, help me generate titles, subtitles. And it was actually recently we shifted our process. So we used to do one story at a time and just kind of work on the titles. And then we decided, you know, we should really just have a meeting where we get everyone together and talk about titles for all of these key articles instead of parsing it out. And during that meeting, it just kept coming up from the group like, oh, we could use ChatGPT for this. Oh, we could use AI for this. And I, in that moment with a group of colleagues that we've never done this process and we've never had this conversation, all of a sudden we all realized the answer was we should be using AI for this. And so I think we're headed into 
plant, we're starting to produce the next issue. So I think we're going to be using that. And that meeting's probably going to have a different flavor. Like we could do all that AI work in advance and then come with ideas and instead of a full brainstorm, have a, a conversation about, oh, what's good about this or what do we like or what are we cutting? So really it's more of a working meeting instead mm -hmm. of, so we've like, you'll skip, we'll skip two steps in that process. We'll come in on step three right. of refining and refining together. And it's funny because like sometimes content creators will be very enthusiastic about creating titles. Mm -hmm. So we have somewhat similar issue with our, our new stories that we're creating. Um, so sometimes we'll say, okay, well, you come up with some title ideas that you can bring to the meeting and then we'll come, we'll, we'll put those into uh, chat GPT and ask for 30 more. And most yeah. of the time, the final decision isn't just one title. It's like combinations and pieces. You're like, oh, that's a clever little, you know, phrase that we could include or something. Like yeah, that. a mashup of a subtitle and a title. And, I, you know, I was at your SEO workshop the other day. So right now I'm just thinking, oh, what does it look like to add in the layer of SEO? Like, okay, Chachi, would you help us or whatever tool you're using, help us do this with these keywords and with this SEO goal in mind. Because when we're talking about a print magazine, the print title is almost never a good digital title. Right. And, you know, that was a change we started making on our team a few years ago, and we've seen great success. But again, it's just like, oh, let's do even more. Right. Yeah. And just by adding that into the prompt and saying, right. you know, make this SEO optimized for this keywords or for this audience. You know, oh, I just got a whole new idea, which is, so we typically run the same story. And I've been thinking like, oh, how, how can we without writing a second story, how can we make this story that's really beautiful for the format and the, the experience that is a print magazine, which I think is read and experienced differently than digital. Absolutely. I think I'm probably going to go back and tell my team, gosh, we should be trying to take this and write an SEO optimized version for digital and see what happens because, well, they're just different mediums and they're different experiences. I don't want to rob the print experience of the, the beauty of that kind of writing, but digital is different. Yeah, for sure. And, and even when you're thinking about how users read on you know, their devices, it's very different than how they're going to read in a print publication. And yeah. we talk about repurposing for different audiences and for different channels, but we don't often think about different mediums, you know, print versus yeah. digital. So that's interesting. Yeah, the medium's different. Like if I see a print magazine without subheads now, it's really difficult for me. And I think that has been fairly common. It's not that subheads in print are uncommon, but when you see print without subheads, it's really hard to enter into the text. Right. It's like, where am I going? What's here? There's, I'm looking at a thousand words. I don't have any sense of what I'm about to experience. When you are in the digital realm, subheads are such a key part of both SEO and UX. It's that experience that if they're, it, I don't think anyone does a digital article without subheads. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And, and so it's a no brainer there, but it's, I'll tell you, it is not a no brainer in print. There are a lot of print products without subheads. Yeah, and it can be overwhelming when you look yes. at a page that's just full of print. And we know that as humans, we scan and we like to read headings and then like pick out what section we're most pick interested in. Pick out where we're going to start. Choose my own adventure. That's one of the themes of this conference is how people want to choose their own adventure. Yeah, absolutely. And you were talking about, um, you know, when you're brainstorming ideas, I think one of the best like ways to start thinking about using AI and really to learn better opportunities, have better opportunities, is to use it creatively, use it as a group where mm -hmm. everyone's coming up with ideas and try this prompt and see what this does and ask it this question because yeah. so many different perspectives and angles to come at it. Yeah, and I think that's so important too to think about what the team norms are. I think I have been t encouraging my team, you can use it, you're empowered. I'm okay with that. I think it's a great tool. And that there has been hesitancy, but the more we talk about it, the more it's becoming apparent that people are using it. And it feels like there's a little bit of a cloak of shame that's being shed because they're like, no, no, really, it's okay. We're going to, and if you're going to do it as a group, then it becomes really okay, really fast. Yeah, absolutely. No one feels like they're cheating or they have to hide that they're using it or right. like, yeah, awesome. So you were talking a little bit earlier about um, a use case for research. Yeah. 
That was exciting. Tell us more about that. Yes. So I work in advancement marketing communications, and we tell a lot of stories about alums. And one of the topics that came up recently in a meeting was that we have all these unsung heroes. And who, who are they? What would it look like to tell the stories of alums who aren't, you know, the alum everyone knows about? And I was playing around, you know, not too long ago. And I was like, how would I do this? Well, how could, I wonder if ChatGPT could help me with this because they launched search. And so I went in and created a prompt that said something like, ChatGPT, I need help writing some alumni stories. I like to be kind of conversational and nice to ChatGPT. I say, could you help me find five C Boulder alumni who are unsung heroes? I put unsung heroes in quotation marks. I'm doing air quotes over here. And... That means that they don't have a lot of PR. There isn't a lot of media coverage about this person, but they're a CU Boulder alum. Give me five examples. And boom, 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 in seconds, of course, I had five real people with names. I had not heard of a single one of them. They were cited. And initially, they, the first time I did this, everyone was more in the sciences realm. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And CU does have a really strong science reputation, a lot of science and engineering research. So I just iterated. I said, okay, well, can you find me five CU Boulder alumni who all have humanities degrees? Mm -hmm. And then boom, 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 five more. And I just thought, holy cow, there's, this is an incredible first step towards solving the problem of how do I find the stories? How do I find the unsung heroes? Um, so I did a little digging because I thought, are they unsung? Because ChatGPT found them. And, you know, I went in and did some digging and I fact checked some. And, you know, the source for one was just a very, very brief Wikipedia article, a lesser known musician. And even I use C Boulder in the prompt. And I did, you know, control S. I looked for C Boulder on that page. It was nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm it found only University of Colorado Boulder. Wow. So even the fact that I didn't have to tell the prompt all of the possible iterations that it should be looking for, and it found people. Because that was a concern, like how many different ways are people gonna say they're alums? How are we gonna know? Right. How um, many different versions if they say, yes, you Boulder, you yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that, that was very exciting. That's I think gonna be a really cool way for us to start telling different stories of different people. Yeah. Absolutely. Without having to go out and try to do all that research yourself and sort through, you know, yeah. the Google results, which a lot of times, you know, aren't as accurate as you would hope they would be. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Tell me more. Tell me more. Yes. I got one other really good one that I'm excited about. So we have people will maybe have heard of Sarah Gillis. She's a C Boulder alumna. Uh, she graduated in, I think, 2015 in aerospace engineering. And she was she's on campus at CU right now. She grew up in Boulder and she's back in town. She works for SpaceX. She recently went, I think it was the longest commercial spacewalk ever. She was in space a few weeks ago. She's also the first person to play violin in space. The videos are incredible of people playing along with her. She was like piped into concert halls playing um, the violin for called like Ray's interlude or something from The Force Awakens. And I thought, gosh, you know, we're doing all this storytelling. This is just a great opportunity to see what would ChatGPT turn up? Like, what would it create about this really well-known alumna? Mm -hmm. So the first time I did, I said, can you write me an alumni profile story about Sarah Gillis? And, and I don't remember the exact details I put in, but something like an alum who graduated from CU Boulder and is an astronaut going to space. And so I got the first story version and it was like, yeah, this is good. I'm not sure if it's all correct. I was kind of hesitant. And then there was a quotation or something in quotes. So I thought, okay, I'm going to fact check this because it just seems off. Like my intuition is like something's off here. I took the quotation and I put it in Google and it does not exist. That quote does not <laughs> exist anywhere. And so I went back to ChatGPT and I said, ChatGPT, where did you find this quote? I can't find it. I searched the internet. It said, oh, I made that up for a narrative effect. I just died laughing. I was like, okay, this is cute. Um, let's, let's try again. So I said, okay, Sarah Gillis is a real person. And could you write a story about Sarah Gillis and cite your sources? And so the next version that came out was also 
It was better, it was stronger, it had citations, but they were not, but they were sources like Space Magazine or Science Journals. And I thought, okay, well, this is a brand story too. And we've probably had conversations with her as a university that others haven't. And what's the perspective that already exists in our collective content across this massive university's website? So I said, okay, can you do this one more time and make sure to use, you know, colorado.edu and see Boulder Today, which is our new site. And boom, another version, much improved, uh, pretty, fa I think all factual. Now, this has not been published. I haven't used it. It really was a test case in what could we do and how could we tell these stories faster. Mm -hmm. It was a really, really quick uh, ex like um, event activation. She just kind of said, I'm coming and the university has come together within like three business days and had a week of activities planned with her. Um, and then the very last thing I did with that was I asked it to help me create a reel for the story. So you've given me the story, now can you give me the reel? And it broke it out. First three seconds, Sweet. here's your opening shot. This is the kind of music. Next four sec seconds, here's your opening shots. Here's your you know, music. Here's the text overlay. And you know, sometimes, again, creative work is fun, but we can have mental blocks about how to approach something. And at the very least, we have a template to, to iterate from and create upon. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time and your insights and some of your excellent use cases with us. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, you can reach out to me at maria.clintz at colorado.eu. You can also find me on LinkedIn. So linkedin.com forward slash Maria Clintz. Awesome. Thank you very much for your time, Maria. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for listening to another episode of AI for You. I hope you found at least one useful thing you can take away and start adding to your workflows and processes today. Remember, the key to making the most of AI is to keep experimenting, keep learning, and of course, keep creating. AI for You is a part of the Enrollify podcast network. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month, and we've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to become a better higher ed professional. Our shows help higher ed professionals find their next big idea and feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Artis Kadu. Day Kibbles, Shane Baglini, and so many other of your favorite leaders in higher ed. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.